Hi everybody, Dave Sugden, and today we're going to talk about character evidence. And again, what we do here at Evidence at Trial is we look to not just master the rules of evidence, but master them in a way that we can apply them during the heat and speed of trial. And so before we get to character evidence, I want to remind ourselves of how we approach every evidence question during trial. And so this is the prism in which we look at any issue that comes our way. We don't just want to wait for these issues to come to us because in the event we do that, we may be able to spot obvious issues but miss less obvious but more important issues. And so, for example, if we hear some witness get on the stand and he or she is talking about some out-of-court declarant statement, we may think, oh, there's, there's a hearsay objection. But the reality is there are a number of exceptions to hearsay and we may be missing more obvious but less obvious but more important objections like relevance or foundation. So now, keeping this in mind, we look at character evidence and character evidence is in that category of evidence issues where the law has for some reason, some policy reason, excluded or limited the type of evidence that can be admitted. And so for example, uh, we look at character evidence, and character evidence, again, is relevant. It, we would love for, in a breach of contract case, for example, to have a witness that say, uh, the person that breached the contract, he was a terrible person in high school, and he cheated on tests, and a host of things. The problem is, is that trials have to end. And in terms of what the cases say as to why character evidence is limited is again, not because it's not relevant, but sometimes it can be too relevant. And so in a breach of contract case, for example, if the plaintiff is able to introduce evidence showing what a turkey the defendant is, the jury may think, well, look, e even in this breach of contract case where the evidence isn't super strong, we just don't like the defendant. So let's find him liable for something. That's one issue, this idea that it may prove too much and blur the issues for the jury to consider. The other reason there's a limit on character evidence is just the idea that trials have to end. Because in our breach of contract hypothetical, if witnesses come and talk about what a turkey the defendant was in high school, well, they're gonna wanna bring in other witnesses that say, no, no, he, he's a wonderful person and you should have seen this person in college. He did all these wonderful things and all of a sudden we have this breach of contract case with a series of mini trials that are essentially litigating the character of the defendant. And so for those two primary reasons, there are limits as to when character evidence can be admitted. Now, when we look at the actual rules of character evidence, it's similar to hearsay in that there's a general rule of exclusion and then followed by certain exceptions. And what can make character evidence more trickier or more complex than hearsay is it's not just a rule followed by exceptions, but in terms of what exception applies to the general rule of exclusion has an impact on the type of character evidence that a jury may hear. And so let's talk about how we wanna approach any issue involving character evidence during trial. And the first thing we wanna ask ourselves is, is character evidence even at issue? And we wanna distinguish between character evidence and habit or custom. And so for example, in the federal rules of evidence, we have the general rule of exclusion, and that is evidence Federal Rule of Evidence 404A. And that says, in general, character evidence is inadmissible to show that a person's character is relevant to show that if he acts, he or she acts a certain way in certain occasions, he or she must have acted on this specified occasion in the same way. But there's a distinction between character evidence and habit evidence. And habit evidence is admissible under federal rule of evidence 406. And we see a similar uh, 
rules in California where you have C California Evidence Code Section 1101A that talks about the general rule of exclusion of character evidence. And then under Section 1105, it talks about the admissibility of habit evidence, whereas character evidence is generally not allowed habit or custom or routine when you're talking about corporations generally is. And so this is the first issue we want to consider. And the distinction between character evidence on the one hand and habit evidence on the other is not always obvious. And when you think about issues of evidence, they're essentially decisions that judges make under an abuse of discretion standard. And so what might be character evidence to one judge may be habit evidence to another. So for example, in California, there's a case worth looking at called Bauer versus Ryan. And in that case, there was a plaintiff who alleged that he went to the dentist and when he went to the dentist, this, this awful dentist would choke him, would kick him, would punch him. And this plaintiff was prepared to bring in 13 other witnesses that said, the same thing happened to me. I would go to this dentist and all this physical harm would happen. And what the trial court said is, look, in the course of this dentist's career, this dentist has seen thousands of patients. And so bringing in 13 other witnesses that allegedly had a similar experience to this plaintiff is not sufficient for there to be a habit. It's therefore inadmissible character evidence. Let's compare that to Bender versus the city of Los Angeles. Now, in that case, we had a plaintiff who brought a lawsuit against the city of Los Angeles alleging civil right violations. And what the plaintiff argued or alleged is that this deputy police officer was unnecessarily rough during his arrest. And what the plaintiff was going to do prior to trial is bring in two other arrestees that says, yes, similar to the plaintiff, I was roughed up by this deputy police officer. In that case, the trial court said, yes, this suggests that this officer has a habit of being unnecessarily rough with arrestees, and so we're gonna allow that evidence as habit. And again, in both cases, because of this abuse of discretion standard, the trial court rulings were affirmed. And so it underscores the importance of first considering whether or not we're talking about a habit or custom issue or character evidence. So now, in the event we're talking about character evidence, we then want to see what are the occasions where it may be allowed. And there are, in essence, three occasions where it can be allowed. One is where the character is actually at issue in the case. The other is when there's the evidence, the character evidence is being offered for some other purpose. And we'll talk about that. And finally, the credibility of the witness. So let's first look at the occasion where a person's character is actually at issue in the case. What does this mean? This comes up a lot in negligent hiring cases or negligent entrustment cases where the character is specifically at issue in the case. And so, for example, in the negligent hiring context, the plaintiff is arguing and alleging that there was an employee at this company that did some bad things and the employer is negligent for hiring this person they knew or should have known was a bad person. And so in order to show what the employer knew, the character of the employee, the bad employee, is directly at issue. Other occasions where it can be at issue is where one of the parties brings it up and makes it an issue. For example, we see in the case of Pew versus C's Candies. This was a wrongful termination case in California. And what the plaintiff alleged in this case is, I was fired, I was wrongfully fired, and while I worked at C's Candy, 
I got along really well. I wasn't disagreeable. I wasn't argumentative. I was a very cooperative employee. And what C's Candy sought to introduce during trial was the person's character and says, no, no, he was disagreeable. He had a ton of problems at work. And on appeal, Mr. Pugh said that was the that was the allowance of character evidence that shouldn't have been allowed. And what the court said in essence was, well, look, once he introduced it, once he put it in issue and said that he was this wonderful employee, his character became an issue in the case. And so when character is at issue in the case, the types of evidence that's allowed to prove the character is almost unlimited. There can be witnesses that talk about the uh, op their opinion or the person's reputation as to the character trait at issue. Uh, this is opinion and character, uh, opinion and reputation evidence, as well as specific instances of conduct. And so going back to the Pew example, there can be witnesses that can talk about specific occasions where the plaintiff in the case was disagreeable or argued with other employees. And so when character is at issue, this is the type of evidence that can be allowed. <clears throat> Let's go back now and look at the occasions again where character evidence can be admitted during trial. The next is when the character trait is being offered for some other purpose. And here, this is where <clears throat> there are a number of issues. You'll see this in California Evidence Code section 1101B, where what the law says is, and this is also in the Federal Rules of Evidence 404B. And so you'll recall that under 1101A and 404A is the general rule of exclusion that says you can't take some character trait and say, because this is the person's character trait, they must have acted this way on a specific occasion. That's out. Under 1101B and 404B, it says, well, you can allow certain character evidence for some other purpose. And the other purpose can be to show the person's motive or the person's opportunity, intent, absence of mistake, for example. And so this is where you see a lot of these Me Too witnesses that become admitted in trial. And so, for example, one of the big cases that deals with this issue in California is Pantoja versus Anton. And again, this was a wrongful termination case where the allegation of the plaintiff was, I had this terrible boss, he would do all these mean things, and he would use profanity and scream at me all the time. And what the defendant argued was, I swore at work, but I wasn't actually swearing at this plaintiff. And so to the extent that she perceived it, or the, to the extent I was swearing, I, I was mistaken. I, I was not trying to swear at the plaintiff directly. And what the plaintiff was able to do is bring in other witnesses to show this other purpose and say, no, I also uh, worked for this person and this person swore at me as well. And so for him to suggest he just swore at work, no, he's not mistaken. This is an absence of mistake. The line between character evidence that's inadmissible versus character evidence that's admissible for some other purpose is sometimes hard to distinguish. And prior to trial and during trial, a lot of fights over when this type of evidence is admitted will often be determined by motion in limine. So consider this rule and these types of cases when considering character evidence that may be offered for some other purpose. In the event this type of evidence is allowed, the only type of evidence are specific instances of conduct. And so, for example, you can't bring in evidence of a person's opinion and you can't bring in evidence of the person's reputation. Finally, we talked about 
the credibility of witnesses. And you'll recall from prior videos that in terms of relevant evidence, the credibility of a witness is always relevant. And so then, well, can we introduce the person's character to impact or have the jury weigh the credibility of the person? And the answer is yes. However, there are limits as to the allowable character traits to go to the person's credibility. So for example, in California, we look at evidence code section 780 and 786. And in the federal rules, we look at rule 608. And what these rules say in essence is when we're talking about credibility, the only allowable character traits is the trait of honesty and veracity. And the only allowable evidence is a person's reputation or the witness's opinion of that evidence. Also, only bad character evidence as to the person's lack of honesty or lack of veracity can be introduced first. In the event this type of evidence is allowed, the person can then respond with good character evidence on the trait of honesty and veracity. But again, it's limited to reputation and opinion evidence. Finally, when this type of evidence is allowed, there's a limited cross-examination permitted. And so, for example, if this person, if there's a case and a person offers good character evidence, for example, in response to a person providing a bad opinion or bad reputation evidence, the cross-examination is limited and it can be on specific instances of conduct, but most courts say it can only be an inquiry and further evidence cannot be allowed, again, to avoid this idea of mini trials. And so to understand the limitations on such cross-examination, People versus Heard in California is a good case to look at because it talks about the limitation and allowable questioning that's permitted. And so, for example, if you have a witness that says, oh, this person is as honest as the day is long, what People versus Heard says is the cross-examination is essentially limited to you asking the witness whether he or she knows or heard more specifically, heard of other occasions that may suggest the person is not as honest as the person suggested. So that is character evidence when it's allowed, when it's at issue, when it's for another purpose or the credibility of the witness. And again, this is one of these examples where we're talking about exclusions. There's our famous chart. And again, at evidence at trial, we look to master the application of these rules. I would encourage you to go to evidence at trial, see live events where we do a deep dive on all of these issues as well as online classes. Thanks again for joining our community.